Hello and welcome to another of our Ash Wheelock Concerts instalments, an interview with our very good friend and colleague Paul Cohen and I hope that you will agree that his first performance of his first three Bach Suites were absolutely wonderful so Paul thank you, that was such a treat for us. Who or what inspired you to take up the cello and pursue a career in music? I think it was a combination of a couple of things. I grew up with, surrounded by music, so music was always on, and my, my father was a music lover. He put on some cellists, and I immediately took to that. I'd have to give special credit to my first teacher. I started in the public schools, and then within a short period of time, I went to study with Edward Blitz, who was then the principal cellist of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. He was a great person for me because as a child, I was very, very shy, very quiet, very uh, intense, and everything was inside. And he was incredibly flamboyant, incredibly, you know, everything was just expressive. And he opened me up a lot, not just as a, as a cellist, but as a person. Just watching him was just so much fun for me because... He loved to play, so he was always playing for me. And he was a big show off, a big ham, and he would just, he would have somebody, he'd say, check this out, watch this. And of course, at that age, it was like, wow, you know. Who or what have been the most important influences on your musical life and your career? That's a hard one because there are so many. I think initially, influences were more dispersed, for example, just going to lots of concerts when I was young. And people I got a chance to hear were legendary people. I heard Horowitz play when, when I was a child, I heard Rubenstein play, I heard Isaac Stern. So that was a big influence. The cello became an obsession. So I listened and studied the great players, of mostly of the, of the 20th century. And I became very fluent in the ways that it was possible to play the cello and play music through the cello, and what it meant to have a personality when you played. How do you pronounce yourself, as the great Casals would say. I have a wall at home with all the cellists that I think are truly great that have changed the history of cello playing on that wall. Can you tell us who, who's on that wall? Well, initially I thought that one of the requirements would be that you'd have to be dead, but I changed that because I did add Yo-Yo Ma, and I did add Honor Bilsma before he passed away. But I started with Casals, who was, to me, the father figure that I grew up listening to. Piotr Gorski, Emanuel Feuermann, Leonard Rose, Jana Starker, Rostropovich, Jacqueline Dupre, Paul Tortelier, who actually is a favorite cellist of mine, but I don't consider him to be as significant historically as these other cellists were, but because it's my wall, I can put whatever I want <laughs> on the wall. All of those cellists contributed to my vocabulary mm -hmm. as a cellist. And so when someone says, who did you study with? I can say who I studied with. There's a wonderful cellist and pedagogue, Fritz Mogg, in Bloomington, Indiana. And I did have some lessons with Jonas Starker, which were very influential, but I feel like I studied with all the cellists, mm -hmm. and I took from all of them. Who is it? Brahms, didn't he once say that we walk on the shoulders of giants? Mm -hmm. I figured. So you, you talked about your studying at Indiana. Do you think that there was ever a time while you were studying that you really thought, this is the career that I want to do? Did you ever have any doubt? Did you ever feel like this is perhaps not the career for me? It was set in stone from a long mm -hmm. time before. I think there were some really difficult times for me at school psychologically. Mm -hmm. And the, the change from being at home and, and then being away and was a difficult one. My living situation was complicated. I had a, a roommate, as people know my last name is Cohen, so people would always see that last name and make a fair assumption that I'm connected, of course, to being Jewish. And they ended up, for some reason, putting me in... My first roommate was a follower of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And he hated Israelis, he hated Jews, and he was my first roommate. And I was 17, and he was a few years older. And he had posters all over the room, you know, the way to 
survival is armed struggle. Well, that, of course, that's obviously the politics of that are extremely complicated. But as a young person, it was it was really difficult to be spoken to that way. And so eventually, we I needed to be moved to another have another roommate, and they moved me in just with someone who seemed very very normal and quiet on the outside, but he turned out to be a heroin addict. So. That was a difficult adjustment, but no, uh, the answer is that I knew I wanted to be a cellist from almost from when I first heard the instrument. The only other thing that I could, I used to dream about was being a baseball player. The truth of the matter is though, I couldn't hit the fastball or the curveball. So I played softball and I played a lot of basketball. What have been some of the greatest challenges of being a professional cellist? I'll start by saying some of the typical things, getting used to new jobs, new new environments, new challenges, uh, playing a lot of chamber music, and then moving to Los Angeles and playing film scores, that was a, that was culture shock for me. I wanted to move back right away, but then I kind of fell into a rhythm with it so I could make a good living and at the same time continue to perform. So that was ideal in a lot of ways. But to truthfully answer your question, I have to actually share something I've never shared with anyone other than someone who's been very close to me. Since the age of 17, I've had to deal with a condition called focal dystonia, which is a complicated movement disorder that involves problematic brain signals being sent to your muscles and causing them to, rather than work in conjunction with one another, to actually work against each other antagonistically. And so, I first experienced this happening to my hand in a performance when I was 17. I was playing in the newly built orchestra hall in Minneapolis, which at the time was an extraordinary place to play. I still think it's a magnificent hall. And I was playing the Sass Hall Concerto, and everything was going fine until the last moment. And at some point in the last moment, I just lost control of my hand. I've had to live with that my whole life as a performer and as a person, and that has been by far the most dramatic challenge I've had to face. I've taken every conceivable medication that affects movement in the body. Some of them help, some of them I couldn't tolerate. I've had, before it became popular, I had Botox injections in my thumb. It was being put into my thumb to find the right spot and to slow down the contractions, to limit the contractions so that they would interfere less with what I was doing. The first time I had it done, it helped somewhat. And then finding the right place and using the right amount became impossible. One of the dramatic memories I have of this was playing a Beethoven cycle with Robbie Murfell, which musically turned out to be, I would have to say, the most expiring experience I've ever had, mm -hmm. combining the, the artist I was playing with as well as the music I was playing with. Sort of a dream come true. A few weeks before we were going to do one of those performances, I got one of those injections. And they put too much in my hand, so I couldn't press mm. the string down with my thumb. So I was left with all these passages where I had to refinger them and not use my thumb. That was pretty dramatic. And then the final bit of the drama, when I was living in LA, I decided to go full throttle because I will push the boundaries if I need to. I had brain surgery deep brain stimulation, uh, wires in my head that, and a battery in my chest and a controller so I, it was possible to change the, the strength of the signal. It was basically talking about weird science. It didn't work for me. Um, so I had all this wiring in my head. My friend used to call me the six million dollar man or something like that. Eventually I just had it taken out. But the important thing is that at that point, as a person, I needed to learn how to separate myself from being Paul the cellist, from being Paul the person. And those who lived with me, those who were close to me, you know, I had to see that, the struggle that I had with it, I had to live with that, it was very difficult. It took me decades, and I think that primarily, it, it's really a function of getting older. It's something that is, I live with every day. It's changed what repertoire I can play. It certainly affected my career. Mm -hmm. And it's had profound effects on me psychologically over time. But at this point in time, over the last maybe five, 10 years, 
I give it almost no thought whatsoever. Mm. I work around it. I change fingerings when I have to. I'm a very flexible hand. I do weird things sometimes. I do what I have to do to get to manage certain passage work. I don't invite it into my life the same way. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, I've grown out of the mental state that was so devastating for so long. But I've, yeah, I've remained a cellist and partly because it's what I do. Mm. I mean, I've made that commitment. It's something that Nick and I often talk about as well is that this, there's no line between who you are and who, what your work is when it comes to music. You, it's all very intrinsic. That's sort and of dangerous though. Is the, do, you find, do you find it dangerous um, with that at all? As a musician, I think your work is, is very much about who you are and your, your music is about who you are. And it is difficult to sort of separate that. It is difficult. I think if you have basically a healthy mindset then you can risk how much you intertwine. You as a human being intertwine with what you do. For me, it was the opposite. I needed to find a way to remove those tentacles. I haven't been a solidly settled person in my head up until quite recently. Mm -hmm. So everyone has to do what they need to do. I'm just wondering if there's any recordings that you have made that you're particularly proud of. Titanic. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Shrek. The Shrek. <laughs> Actually, the recordings I'm happiest with are live performances mm. that turned out really well. <laughs> For an audience listening, they may really like something or they may not. But it may be difficult or impossible, unless you play an instrument, to know the why they like it or the level of what they're hearing. You know, that's not the point if you're a listener. I did a, a solo disc many many years ago and it was very it was nicely done I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it but it feels like yeah, it's a long time ago so the a more recent vintage I would say some of the stuff I have up on SoundCloud Brahms F major sonata a block viola suite a performance of the C minor Bach there is a performance of it that I'm quite happy with that I don't know that I would do better if I sat there and edited out one little note and replaced it. It's it's quite well played, so and it has all the energy of a live performance. And I I kind of like that. I mean, because I grew up with these old recordings and these individuals would play through a, a movement and if something what didn't go right, okay, play through the movement again, you know. <laughs> so normally when we do that, right, something else doesn't go right. So I, I got used to some of the inconsistencies that they would have, they would play very freely and they weren't worried as we are today about everything being so perfect mm -hmm. because the technology wasn't there to inform them. The Canadian Marshall McLuhan would say that the medium is the message. So if you have all this incredible technology, then what you're going to do with it is max it out. Mm -hmm. You're going to use it as much as you can. So that works for someone like Glenn Gould, whose idea was to put every single note in a particular place in a particular way. It's a certain type of artistry. Yeah, it's a certain type yeah. of artistry that I think is like the difference between a film and a, a, a theater performance. Mm -hmm. So a theater performer needs to project, and a film actor needs to have subtlety in their expressions. If you do too much, it looks ridiculous in a film. <laughs> I think also as you go through your life, the different recordings that you make from when you're young are obviously very different from the recordings that you make when you're much more experienced. When you're what? <laughs> <laughs> With Apple Hill, we did some that I think were really wonderful. I think uh, one particular recording that never really went anywhere that I think is superb is uh, a John Harbison piano quintet. I think it's a, an exciting work, magnificent piece. And I think it's played really well. Mm. So I'm very proud of that. But that's sort of a random mm. random piece out of nowhere. I suppose that takes me on to my next question. I mean, I think I'd like to ask you if whether there's any composers or works that you particularly associate yourself with more that you understand the written language of certain composers more than others, whether there's particular works that you feel more inspired or more inclined to to play. The answer to that would differ depending on my mood. 
there are certain pieces that when I perform them and listen to them, I do feel a kinship with them. And that's, I think, the most important thing. In the cello piano repertoire, I would say the, the F major Brahms sonata, I would say the A major Beethoven sonata. I grew up, my favorite piece for the cello was the Dvorak concerto. And I did get a chance to play the Dvorak concerto I, maybe four times, and I can't tell you what a thrill that was. I adore it so much, and I think it's so great that that would be a piece that would be on my, my list of works that when I played them, it felt very special for me. Mm -hmm. Has there been a performance where you have really felt like it was the best performance with, you know, whether it was a larger scale chamber work or a solo work, where there's been something that you have just gone, this is just the best experience I've ever had on stage. For me, it's more a state I love to reach when I, when I play, which is, I guess I would say, sort of a state of ecstasy when I'm playing. Mm -hmm. And if I can reach that state, then, then it feels very, that is special, and I, I, I trust that that infuses itself into the music. But there's no way to summon that. You, you can't just say, in 10 minutes, I'm going to be in a state of ecstasy. I, you know, you know. So the only way I know how to do that and that anyone knows is to be prepared and to, be, to know something inside and out, to have a firm foundation, and then go out and you find yourself in a particular way being able to work with what you've prepared, but it isn't, it starts to be different. It starts to reflect the moment. It starts to reflect something more personal that is immediate, not something that was prepared over a long period of time. It, it feels as if you're inventing it on the spot. And when you, when I reach that moment, that moment, that's perhaps when I start to feel as if I'm kind of transcending the normal experience of just playing the instrument, which can be very moving or can be very intense sometimes, but it feels as if it becomes more elevated. And I love those moments happen and they sometimes, sometimes they happen in a performance and it lasts for a few minutes and it's gone. And it doesn't mean anyone would be aware of it. I don't think, but I'm certainly aware of it as a, as a musician and that, so, that's always the fantasy. Can, can I reach that special state? More often than not, no. But when it happens, then it's, I think, all that, all that music can be for that particular person at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. As a musician, what is your definition of success? I think all of us have these ideas of what it means to be a musician when we're young. Mm -hmm. And we follow that as a dream, and that kind of drives us along and may, may be very specific. I want to play in an orchestra. And there are so many people who have these specific goals. I even, when I was living in L.A., I remember walking with a young violinist. And we had just finished a really long, really pretty boring session on something. And he said to me, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is dreamt about this my whole life. Initially I was sort of horrified, but then I thought, no, this is this is this is special. You've always wanted to do this and you're doing it. These days I define it in kind of simple terms, which is I value professionalism, which to me means consistency. And that means holding oneself to a certain standard uh, every time I play. I can't meet that, but that's what I aspire to. And the more I aspire to it, I think the better chance I have of, of, of doing that. So I kind of look at it this way. If, if my playing exists in a practice room in between these two points, mm -hmm. then my goal is to be able to take this and put it on stage. Mm -hmm. And knowing full well that it's going to range, depending on any number of factors. 
And for me, a professional is someone who's consistently doing that, as opposed to someone who can play spectacularly well one night and then they lose concentration, they don't, they don't prepare properly, and then some other performances down here, and you're constantly getting this. I value a professional, someone who does their work honorably and consistently and leaves the, the more romantic things aside and just embraces the simple art and craft of what a person is doing. So, yeah, consistency. Consistency. Yeah. A 60th birthday dream. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You heard it. This is what I have to deal with. Here's one for all the aspiring musicians. What do you consider to be the most important ideas and concepts to impart? I have a few things to say about musicians, but I, I feel very strongly that music is really just another way of trying to, to live and to express oneself and to do something. It is... I don't separate being a musician from being um, being aspiring in any other field. When I was going to school, things that we didn't learn, that we should have learned, that would have helped us all, would have been learning how to interface between nonprofit work and the business world. Mm -hmm. That the business world is a fact. You need to learn about nonprofits. You need to learn some basics about them, about how to build a board, about how to how to raise money, about how to delegate different uh, you know, authority within that, about how to spread yourself, so, how to work so you don't spread yourself too thinly. And um, I think that would be a great part of an, edu of an education. If you don't get it at school, I would say spend some time pondering that if you have aspirations to build something. Just understanding the, the mechanisms that drive our profession in the business of music it is important. But what I feel most strongly about has really nothing to do with specifically with musicians. I think that as a young person, regardless of what you're trying to do, I don't care if you're trying to be an architect, I don't care if you're trying to be a doctor, you need to take care of your body. You need to learn how to take care of it and how to remain physically active and to do it and enjoy it. And what I'm, I would be saying to a young person is find an activity that you love or that's fun. You know, so put your phone down, get out of the house, and it will make everything about your life better if you can be healthier and stronger and more vibrant. And you can't just think this stuff. You have to actually do it. So number one, take care of your body, please. And you know, you know what? There are no excuses. You need to take responsibility for your future, for your future potential family, for your endeavors, for every reason under the sun mm -hmm. you have to do that. The other strong bit of advice I have for young people is I think it's really important to read. Reading is very important in all areas. Explore the world. If you can, sure, if you can travel, that's fantastic. You have the money and the time. That's great, but that's a little harder to access on a regular basis. A book is not. And, and when I say a book, I mean a book. I don't mean a Kindle, and I don't mean a screen. I mean a real book. And you have a library. You don't, you can, anyone can check out a book from a library. You don't have to have any money to do that. And you have the whole world at your fingertips. Being a lifelong learner is something that's also incredibly important to anything that you do because it makes you more open, it makes you more substantial. And I think learning is a natural, this is natural to human beings. So there's no reason you shouldn't have some skill in, in, in understanding of science or math, history, literature. It's all there and it should be part of everyone's life. Mm -hmm. And it informs everything that you do in terms of the quality of person you become and how you treat other people. Because a more open, informed mind is a, a, the type of person who makes this world a better place. You know, we're obviously using music as a tool to take into all of the schools. And why is music such a good tool 
for children to have in their education? Everyone needs a, a form of artistic expression. And without that, there's a lacuna, there's, a, there's an emptiness that, that people have and will end up filling with something else if they are able to write or they are able to draw. You can establish your, your, your independence in your own self. And I think that more recent discoveries of, of the effect of, of music on the brain and, and the way in which it, the brain studies on people who play an instrument every day over the course of about 10 years, you will have done more for your cognitive ability and for your future. People who, who do this end up in Ivy League schools. They end up having better incomes. They end up being uh, cognitively much sharper than they would have been otherwise. What you get from, what your brain gets is the type of food that almost nothing else can be given if you play an instrument. That's actually scientific truth. If you doubt what I say, Google it and find out for yourself. Just plug in string ins, playing a string instrument effect on, on the brain and you'll find it and you'll be shocked. And teachers should know about this. Parents should know about it. This is the opportunity to give your child a better future or to whatever point in life you are, to give yourself a better future. Play a, string, play a string instrument or any instrument. It's basically sort of not publicized enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know why educators don't publicize this more. I would love to see a world in which music is a huge part of every child's education. Yeah. You know, not only to encourage children to, to play a musical instrument, just, but just for the tools that it brings, expecting more from yourself and giving a child an opportunity to push themselves not only in exactly. music but in life to expect yes. more from themselves so that they are set the challenge of doing something and having to rise to that challenge i think children are incredibly sophisticated little humans they, and i think they are if you set them a challenge in the right way in a structured way in a way that's going to show them the benefits of their hard work and efforts then it can be so exciting to see them grow and it would be amazing. It would be amazing. Yeah. You know, what we're talking about reminds me of a, uh, something that happened to me when I was, when I was very young with, with my, uh, my first teacher. I came in and I had already been able to, I was already playing, I could play a little bit. And I was playing in first four positions. And, you know, he took me back to first position and I was like, oh. Because he was, he was changing all sorts of things. So he gave me this exercise and it was very simple. And, you know, I just thought, come on, man, what are you, okay. So he gave me a week to learn this thing. I could have said, I say very well. Anyway, so he said, that's really good. And he's very enthused. Wonderful, bravo. Now, he said, I want you to try something with this. I'm going, oh, God, you know, I'm going to be moving on. Well, what I want you to do is I want you to after each half note to pluck the C string. He showed me and I thought, hmm, hmm, I don't think I could do that right now. So I, of course I went home and practiced and practiced and practiced, came back and he said, excellent, that's, that's a lot to do in one week. And you're really getting some like the sense of things. I thought, good, now I can get to number two because it's really fast and I can really show him that. And he said, we're gonna do one more thing. What's that? Well, I want you to play this and I want you to pluck the C string after each note and I want you to hold the third finger down on the G string while you're playing it. Now, all this just means is that since I didn't have to use the third finger, that's where it had to stay. So it's just creating a sense of independence of the fingers. Now, that was one thing that's obvious that he was trying to do. But the other thing was, as a teacher, he was trying to find out what I would do when I was faced with obstacles. He was putting intentional obstacles in front of me to see what this young kid would do. And my, my attitude was like, I can do that. And give me a week and I'll do it. Now, that's important because we always run into obstacles, even if someone doesn't put them there, we run up to a point on our playing where it's like, I can't 
get this? What do I do? And, well, what you do is you keep going. You, you find a way around those obstacles. And those tests are, that are built into learning anything are so important to, uh, to not remove them from education, to make sure that tests and challenges are understood to be part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. That's what makes us better. And that's what makes, gives us, as you were just saying, a sense of accomplishment and pride, mm -hmm. and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. And it builds character. I wondered if you might share with us just a few uh, particular challenges that 2020 has presented you. It's certainly been difficult. I missed being able to be in the presence of and have some physical contact with the people that I love, with the friends that I love. Um, you know, I kind of feel for everyone. We all have different problems and given that some of us can work from home and some of us can't, I think that we're very fortunate that at the beginning I committed to doing the rehearsing in, in March mm -hmm. and that we've worked together and that and being able to work on music with you and Nick has, has kept me much more, I mean, functional and in a way that not doing it would have been mm -hmm. devastating. I know that you have a very interesting collection of pets. And I Do I? If you might share with us. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah, I brought that. This is oh my, gosh. <laughs> my young, beautiful, oh. one of my two, ball pythons. Her name is Celeste. She's terribly dangerous and aggressive, as you can see. <laughs> um, they're called ball pythons because they hang out this way, and they also, if they get spooked, they ball up, but they're, I prefer to think of her as the royal python, Python Regius, from sort of sub-Saharan Africa, western, the western parts, you can find them in the savanna, in the grass, or you can find them in the jungle. So what African kings used to do, let's just see if she'll open up and just chill. Aww. And just, there we go. So what African kings used to do <laughs> is they would put them around their neck and use them as, as it was like sort of ancient bling living bling, you know, and they would have their robes and everything. So in these countries, these are very precious creatures. Also in nature, they're, they're not aggressive towards humans at all. Um, and she, this one is very special to me because she did get out of her enclosure and I, she was missing in the room for a month and a half. No food, no water. And I couldn't find her. I did everything I was told to do. Put down some heat, put down some food. Nothing worked. And then one day I'm sitting there in the room and there she is looking pretty skinny, but she was fine. And I got her in, into a hot enclosure and started feeding her. And so she's, I think she's doing really great. And her name is Celeste. And it took me a while to realize that I had heard the name Celeste, and so I liked the name. And then I realized, Celeste, Celeste, boy. <laughs> you were like, you're making Freud smile on his grave, so. So you have this beauty, and you mentioned you had an, another one. Yes, I have one that is substantially older and larger. How much larger? Uh, she's about four feet and, and very, very thick. I mean, probably two or th um, she's going up, she likes to go in underneath clothes sometimes. I don't let her. She just likes to... <laughs> yeah. These creatures are able to tell the difference. They, they can hunt in pitch black because they have something called infrared uh, heat sight. Mm. So they can sense the difference between a change in three one thousandth of a degree of temperature. Wow. So if anything living is anywhere, a heart is beating, or something is, you know, 
exuding any warmth at all, mm -hmm. they find it. Here's the thing about snakes. Uh, they don't have, they, they are curious and they like texture and they like warmth. Mm -hmm. So they're fine with being held. However, they don't have any emotional center to their brain. So there is no, mm -hmm. she feels no particular connection to me. She's comfortable because she's familiar with my smell or my way I handle her, but she's, so it's a matter of comfort and familiarity, mm -hmm. not affection. Mm -hmm. I'm, the, I'm the one who feels the affection. And just quickly as well, I know yeah. that um, snakes is not your only Snake. pet. So you've, you've yes, had Sachi, your dog, is... you have your two snakes, and, and there I is, have, there's something you know, else. I have 20 tarantulas. 20 tarantulas. Yeah. Yeah, those are, that was my fascination. And that also goes back to childhood when I was introduced to one at a natural history museum. Mm -hmm. That was, that image What was it about, about the tarantula? That, that because it was incredibly you. scary and it was incredibly <laughs> fascinating. And I love scary and fascinating. So, I don't mind, you know, it's, it's something about darkness, it, 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 they are also very shy and, and mostly very docile, mm -hmm. but sometimes when you feed them, you, you, you see that the ferocity is just, even though they're comparatively small compared to humans, obviously, they're, they're, that is really a, an amazing thing to see. They, there are over a thousand species of them. I have different, they're different colors, different mm -hmm. temperaments, different behaviors, different, they need different temperatures, different humidity. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, I, I, given what I have, you know, the animals have sort of woven their way into my, my life. I have to get up and take care of, make sure that the water is right, mm -hmm. the humidity is right. And I have to put in, in the winter, it's awful in New England because it's so dry mm. with the heat on. So I have to fill up the humidifier and run it 24 seven in that small room I keep them in. So, mm. so anyone who ever gets to know me or visit me, you don't have to worry, they're in beautiful enclosures and you won't know that they're there. They're much quieter than I am, so. Um, <laughs> and much less dangerous than 